you know, there's, there's, since the piece premiered and it was very famous, you know, pretty quickly after it premiered in 1924, there have been lots of different interpretations about the ways that this piece, you know, reflects and refracts both George Gershwin's life as well as um, the city of New York City around him. Hello, Ryan. How are you? I'm doing well, thank you. How are you doing? I'm oh, fine, thank you. It's so lovely to meet you here on Zoom. Yes, likewise. Thank you for the invitation to talk. Well, and thank you for your time. Um, you've done such a great um, project, the Rhapsody in Blue. Yeah, can you tell me exactly what what inspired you to to do this this project? Sure. Yeah. So. Um, you know, I'm a, a historical musicologist by training, and mm -hmm. during my doctoral work uh, for my dissertation, I undertook a, a large-scale research project that was all about Rhapsody in Blue. And mm -hmm. it started off um, really with an accidental finding in the Library of Congress, uh, which is where the George Gershwin archives are. Um, this item actually found, uh, that inspired the whole project for me with Rhapsody in Blue was found in the Leonard Bernstein collection. Um, as you know, oh. Bernstein is a famous interpreter of Rhapsody in Blue. Mm -hmm. And I was going through some of the documents from his youth uh, when he was a, a teenager mm -hmm. and found a notebook that had an arrangement of Rhapsody in Blue inside of it. And it was an arrangement not for orchestra, not for you know even jazz band like the Paul Whiteman Ensemble, but rather for a, a group of summer camp students at a summer camp uh, that he was a counselor at um, during a summer uh, out in Western Massachusetts. And so it was an arrangement that is for, um, you know, uh, camp instruments like um, percussion, recorder, uh, accordion, ukuleles, uh, singers. It was this wild arrangement. And, it, and so that got me going on this whole path of arrangements of Rhapsody in Blue. And that the history of Rhapsody in Blue is really more than just George Gershwin's composition, that it's a lot more about the other musicians that have been part of that arranging process. And so my dissertation, which became my first book, uh, which is titled Arranging Gershwin, um, Rhapsody in Blue and the Creation of an American Icon, um, it's, that whole book is about different arrangements. And one of the arrangements in that book is this version of Rhapsody in Blue um, that has just come out um, in a critical edition and has be now become this wonderful new recording. That's amazing. And initially, was it the interest of Rhapsody in Blue? Uh, are you, uh, did you like the music that you, that you wanted to do the research on it? Or was it just by coincidence that you uh, came across that? Yeah, I, I've always been a fan of George Gershwin's music. Um, you know, similar to to Leonard Bernstein. When you know, when I was a kid, my my uh, parents bought me a copy of the sheet music for Rhapsody in Blue as well. And I always, you know, spent time as a as a as a um, teenager, learn trying to learn how to play the piece on the piano. Um, I can play it now, not great. I'm definitely not not okay. as, as great as uh, some interpreters of the piece uh, mm -hmm. by any stretch of the imagination. But yeah, I've always enjoyed. Uh, Rhapsody in Blue in particular, but also just George Gershwin, George and Ira Gershwin's songs. Um, mm -hmm. You know, as, as a jazz pianist, I love sitting down and just improvising around those amazing melodies and chord changes. Mm -hmm. So this uh, version of the recording that you've done now, which version is that? Is that the original version of how he intended it to be? Yeah, so uh, this version is part of the, you know, the critical edition um, that's being done by the George Gershwin Initiative at the University of Michigan. And this is as best we can determine what the original version of Rhapsody in Blue yeah. sounded like when it had its premiere um, in, in 1924. And the way this came about was through um, really looking at a, a variety of different documents. Um, obviously, mm -hmm. we didn't have uh, recording technology, so we don't know what it sounded like in the in Aeolian Hall when it premiered. Um, but we do have a number of different manuscripts and other recordings, um, including um, you know there's three um, scores, manuscript scores that are in the Library of Congress um, that we used. Um, and in my work as an editor, kind of triangulated the different the three different manuscripts to get our best guess at what what was the original intention of 
of um, of the authors, um, and you say authors, you know, plural, um, more mm-hmm. than more than just Gershwin, because um, it was a really it was it was definitely a collaborative effort from the outset, um, which is why I you know have this whole approach to Rhapsody in Blue as an arrangement, and this first version is is the original arrangement of the piece. Um, and I don't know how familiar you are with the kind of the origins of the composition of the piece, but I can tell you a little bit more about that. Yes, please. Um, yeah. So, um, you know, as, as the story goes, um, George Gershwin's brother, Ira, was reading the newspaper in, um, you know, January of 1924 and saw a, a newspaper ar- uh, article saying that George Gershwin was at work on a jazz concerto. And as the story goes, George is like, well, I probably should, I should probably go get working on that. Oh. Um, and, and so there's, there's this myth around the origins of Rhapsody in Blue that, you know, George Gershwin got this commission from Paul Whiteman and forgot about it and then just, you know, wrote it real quick. And he did write it very quickly, um, but he, I, don't, I don't know that it's true that he for, actually forgot about it. Um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful story, um, but there's evidence that he started working on the piece before the, um, the newspaper uh, article came out. But what Gershwin wrote uh, when he wrote Rhapsody in Blue is not the full piece with the orchestra or even the jazz band um, with it. What he wrote was um, was a two piano score. So he wrote uh, one part was the uh, solo piano part, and the other part was the jazz orchestra. And he let someone else arrange the piece for the Paul Whiteman Ensemble, which is, is standard. You know, Gershwin was a... a, a, a Musical theater composer by training, and you know, never would arrange or orchestrate his songs for performance in the theater. He wrote he wrote the melodies and the and the and the chords, um, and someone else then filled out the parts for all the instruments that were oh, played. Okay. Mm-hmm. So that was standard practice, um, and remains so today as well. Um, and so when when Gershwin wrote Rhapsody in Blue, he wrote it as a two piano score. He made a few indications here and there um, that you know of which instruments he might want to have the orchestra Mm -hmm. playing, but the Paul Whiteman Orchestra was not a standard orchestra. It was a jazz ensemble, and even in the 1920s, the exact makeup or instrumentation of a jazz ensemble was very flexible and and very very variable. Today, if you think about a jazz band, you think about saxophone section, trombone section, trumpet section, Mm -hmm. rhythm section, Um, but the Paul Whiteman Orchestra had eight violins and it had um, really? and it had oh, and it wow. had uh, french horns and it had um you know a banjo player and mm-hmm. so all of these instruments are part of that original sound of rhapsody in blue that we've kind of recaptured in this arrangement in this critical edition of the piece mm-hmm. and so and the person oh sorry yes no so uh, normally you hear it with a, a greater with a bigger uh, orchestra when you when you uh, when you think of it now, when you listen to it, it's a bigger orchestra. But that orchestra was just a smaller, a smaller orchestra. Correct. Yeah. So the version that most of us are familiar with is mm-hmm. for a big, large, you know, kind of romantic era size symphony yeah. orchestra um, with a you know huge string sections, um, very powerful brass, um, and then you know very much featuring the the pianist is the kind of concerto soloist in the middle. And that's an arrangement that was done after this original one. But both the that, that big one that we know for the orchestra and the arrangement that we have here today, that's the Paul Whiteman Orchestra arrangement, were done by the same person. And that was uh, by, by a man named Ferdy Groffet, who is most uh, familiar maybe for his composition called the Grand Canyon Suite. But Groffet was an arranger for the Paul Whiteman Orchestra. And he did this original arrangement um, largely giving us what the sound of the orchestra is in Rhapsody in Blue, both in its you know, more thinned out lean version, um, which is the recording that we're, we're celebrating now, um, uh, as well as creating that arrangement for the full symphony orchestra uh, a few years later on. Oh, okay. So originally it was like that, uh, it, it was more uh, sort of stripped down for that, yeah. Yeah, more stripped down, uh, as I mentioned, had you know eight violins. Uh, mm-hmm. They added in French horns to performance. Um, there were uh, four, or sorry, excuse me, three uh, reed players, wind players that doubled on a whole bunch of different instruments um, and switched around between oboe and uh, saxophone and different types of saxophones. We have a, a baritone saxophone in there and even a sopranino saxophone, which is the smallest of the saxophone family. Um, and so it, it it had you know trombones and it has uh, Trumpets. It's, it's a, it is a smaller orchestra in total than we, we expect in a in an orchestra today. 
But this is wonderful that you that you actually did it. You know that you didn't just write about it and and do the research, uh, but that you actually now that we have we have the information, but we also have the sound of of how you th you you can uh, almost uh, not, not it's like you say there wasn't a recording before of it, but you you can now imagine how this was intended to be. It really is wonderful because one of the you know the challenges of being a, a musicologist is we we write lots of articles we write lots of books but to actually get to make the sound out of the research is really a thrill. Yeah, and um, in this uh, research that you've done, have you uh, come across many interesting things about his life and about why he, or is there a story behind? This music is there something uh, why he wrote it or or uh, the inspiration behind it? Yeah, um, you know, there's there's since the piece premiered and it was very famous, you know, pretty quickly after it premiered in 1924. There have been lots of different interpretations about the ways that this piece, you know, reflects and refracts both George Gershwin's life mm -hmm. as well as um, the city of New York City around him. Right, I think there's a lot of connections um, in in popular imagination around uh, Rhapsody in Blue and New York City, um, but also a little bit around George Gershwin. Um, that you know, there's the the story of what we call symphonic jazz, right, or or you know, classical music mixed with jazz music that was very popular in the 1920s. Um, was that it's this idea of taking something that's popular, that's out, you know, that's uh, kind of you know in the clubs and more on the street. Um, and raising it to the level of, of the concert hall and kind of elevating it. And so that's a story that's been told a lot about the Rhapsody in Blue. Um, about the composition and where it fits into George Gershwin's life specifically, you know, he was in 1924 just be starting to become famous as a songwriter. He had had his first big hit oh, with a know. song named Swanee. He was really starting to take off in his career and he was extremely busy. And so one of the stories that goes alongside with, with Rhapsody in Blue a lot is that you know it's there's a there's a theme in the in the in the piece a melodic uh, section that mm -hmm. sounds like a train, and and so people think that he he wrote that train theme or train piece while traveling not on the subways in New York but rather between New York City and Boston where the musical he was working on was was under under rehearsal, oh, and so that train theme is the one that kind of goes it goes da 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 and underneath that train theme, we hear this kind of chicka 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 chicka. This is rhythm that sounds like a train. So, um, so people think that maybe that's when when he wrote it. Um, you know, we don't have any real evidence or way mm -hmm. to corroborate that, but it does sound like the rhythms of the jazz age. There's a lot of mm -hmm. that energy that he's captured um, from from the world of of New York City um, and beyond in the piece. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. Um, and that's that you know that you can hear these things in in the music. It's it's good if you you know if you're aware of it, then you can sort of imagine also where it comes from. But what I find very interesting is that you say it was very popular as he he you know when he wrote it, uh, it was immediately very popular. And you find many times from. Um, uh, pieces and, and new pieces and new sounds that composers write, uh, that it takes a while for an audience to get used to it, or it takes a while for, for people to start uh, liking, you know, and, and enjoying it. And yet in this case, it wasn't. What do you think was, and, and most of his music is very popular and, um, and, and even now, you know, it's still in these, all the time, it's still very popular and still very um, appreciated. But what do you think about his work? Why is that? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think, um, I think two, two reasons. Mm -hmm. uh, the reason that it became very popular in the 1920s was because 
it was um, not premiered by a symphony orchestra, but rather it was premiered by Paul Whiteman and his orchestra. And Paul Whiteman was one of the most famous entertainers of the era, right? He was, he was someone who, whose face and image uh, was instantly recognizable, um, almost as much so as like Mickey Mouse. And, um, and his music and recordings were also very popular. So what Paul Whiteman did at following the premiere of the piece was he took it on tour. He and his band went oh, with okay. George Gershwin yeah. and they played many, many concerts in big cities around the country so other people could hear the work. Um, not, uh, just a few months after the premiere, they also went into the recording studio and made a very popular recording um, of, of the work, which is, is short uh, because it was recorded on a 78 RPM uh, record, which could only hold about three and a half minutes of music, four minutes of music on each side. So they had to edit and truncate the piece and make it almost more of a pop song in duration than, oh, yeah. um, than an orchestral piece. So I think part of its success was it was it, you could enjoy it and digest it in a small small listening section. It wasn't mm -hmm. where you would have to sit down and listen to a forty minute piece of music. It was it was really a, a nine minute piece of music uh, for a long time. So I think that's what made it popular in the nineteen twenties. I think what's made it popular over time is um, George Gershwin's early death. You know, he he died um, a young man. Um, maybe a dozen or so years after this piece was premiered. So, as a composer, um, the piece has really, was really celebrated and, and, and became more popular as a result of his, his passing away early, um, oh. along with other works of his, of his that have been celebrated, like, like Porgy and Bess. Um, but because he didn't write a lot of Rhapsodies, he didn't write a lot of other pieces, you know, there's a handful of, of these works that are for, you know, piano and orchestra. Um, because there's fewer of them, um, I think they're celebrated to a greater extent than if he had written, mm -hmm. you know, a hundred of them, right? If he had written a hundred orchestra pieces, then maybe Rhapsody in Blue would have just been thought of as an early piece. Yeah. But because he wrote fewer and it became so successful, it is it has been continued to be celebrated in that way. Mm. And uh, tell me, what is your wish for, for this project? What would you like to see happen here? Yeah, I, so I, you know, as I mentioned at the start of our conversation, mm -hmm. my, a lot of my research and work is about arrangements of Rhapsody in Blue. And that's part of my larger um, kind of work around the concept of arrangement studies. And what I would love to have happen with this particular arrangement, this critical edition, is um, for people to pick it up and play it, of course, we want to hear what it sounded like in its original form, but also to, to know that they're not locked into this particular arrangement, right? If, if we don't know if George Gershwin improvised during the premiere or not, um, there's the scholars that feel differently about that, whether he did or he, or if he just played the notes that were on the page. So I would love for, for pianists to feel free to interpret this how they wish to play it. It doesn't need to be exactly done the way that we have it on the um, on the page. Mm -hmm. um, ensembles don't need to have someone who can double on all of the you know required wind instruments. They could hire individual musicians to play the different parts. You know the 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 bass clarinet only plays for four measures. The bass clarinet and soprano saxophone in order to it work. You can you can play with arrangement, and I would like to see people play around with it and 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 keep it flexible. Um, but do you think composers? Uh... I mean, do you think he would have agreed to that? Do you think he was the type of composer who would, would have said, uh, use it like this or, or experiment with it like this? Yes, absolutely. Um, really? You know, he was, yes, mm -hmm. because, because he, and the reason I say that is because he was a composer both in the popular and classical realms. Mm -hmm. And if you think about his popular songs, many of which have become jazz standards, right? They're, they're improvised and played in many forms all the time. So mm -hmm. I think he would just be happy to know that we're still playing the piece and that it's really? still being, being mm -hmm. enjoyed in the ways that it is. Well, I think this is a great, it's, it's a great wish really, because I think that this would also give um, musicians the, the opportunity to experiment with this piece, you know, to, to uh, also have a bit more freedom. And I wonder also in this time where we went through this pandemic and and uh, this lockdown period, if if there will be musicians who re really uh, 
will feel this excitement to do something like that, you know, especially younger musicians. I find that younger musicians are uh, maybe also now experimenting in other ways rather than, you know, to, to get themselves in the market or to get themselves out there. And it seems like this whole project with, uh, that you're talking about, how they released it into, into uh, the world was by a good marketing strategy by that time, you know? If you think of it that way. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a really good way to think about it. And I think that there's an excitement and opportunity as mm -hmm. hopefully we continue to reemerge from this pandemic period to to be more experimental, to try things in a different way, right? Yeah. We don't need to do um, our programming and our performance and our, our, our orchestra seasons the same way that we've done them before because we, we've got an opportunity to do things a, a little bit more flexibly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but tell me, Ryan, you are also an artistic director um, at, at a school, at an at a academy? Yeah, at Colorado College, which is a, a small liberal arts school um, in here in Colorado. Um, and uh, so I'm the, I'm the director of performing arts. And mm -hmm. my position is here to create these collaborations and, and kind of, again, creative experiments, um, not only between students and faculty that are performers or creators or artists, but also to find ways to make connections between the arts and everything we do across campus. So finding mm -hmm. connections to the sciences, for example, or finding connections to, mm -hmm. um, to philosophy or, or to um, our arts center that we've got here, the Fine Arts Center at Colorado College as well, so that we can really get people to create and think about these ideas because I think uh, I've spoken to many artists over the lockdown period and, and uh, you know, talked about this specific thing that uh, art really should be part of mainstream education because there is so much uh, um, linking between the arts and the sciences, really, and, and the arts and many things in life. And this is wonderful if you're... Um, school you know if you do that already there and and make young people aware of this because i think this is also part of the education is to make the younger generation aware of this connection yeah i think it's in incredibly important not only uh for our younger generation our students to have exposure and experience in the arts but also because you know we know as artists um, that that you know when you have experience and you have um, opportunities to engage the arts, you start thinking about creative processes and ways of solving problems differently, right? You fight, figure yeah. out how to make something happen, you know. And I think we think that bring this back to George Gershwin, they had to figure out how to bring a piece into the world in a few weeks. And so, how do you mm -hmm. solve that problem of we've got to get this brand new piece together? We've never done anything like this before. And we're going to have this amazing, you know, experiment in modern music concert that was highly publicized. So mm -hmm. how do you get from point A to point B um, mm -hmm. and, and do it together collaboratively? And that really yeah. is yeah, exactly the sort of work that we're trying to do at Colorado College, mm -hmm. too. Well, this is amazing. And uh, is there any way uh, we uh, that I can, do you have any links for me that I can put um, underneath this video so that we can see the work that you're doing there? Yeah, I'd be happy to forward those to you. Yeah, please, please do that. And then, um, and this book that you wrote, is that also available to buy? It is, yeah, it is available. Yeah. It's called Arranging Gershwin, Rhapsody mm -hmm. in Blue, and the Creation of an American Icon. And I can certainly yeah. send you a link, link to that as well. Yes, please. And this book, is it now, uh, would uh, just musicians enjoy this book or would anybody uh, uh, that's not a musician also find it interesting? I would hope so. I tried really hard to write it in a way that was you okay. know, something that would could be enjoyed by by people beyond um, you know music scholars yeah. and musicians. Um, and if people find that the analysis or some of the details are too much, you can skip those paragraphs and still get oh, the okay. uh, still get the mm -hmm. meaning of the book. It's, yeah. I, I think it's it's very enjoyable. One of the things I think you know uh, readers might enjoy re uh, learning more about from the book is I have a whole whole chapter um, that is about. Um, versions of Rhapsody in Blue that have been in popular culture, including um, United Airlines, which has used the piece very really? much 
that. Yeah. Well, this was now so lovely to talk to you, Ryan. And thank you so much for your time. And please um, let me know anytime if there's something that the school does um, that, you know, a project that you want to talk about, because my passion is really education in, in music and, and art. Um, I think, and, and this platform, I would love to use for that to see what, what is happening and, and all the different things that, that uh, all the different projects, because I think this is also inspiring to see and, and to know about, you know, and, um, and if I can, in a way, make this more known about, then I would love to do that. Well, thank you so much. I very much appreciate that. And we'll certainly be in touch more. Okay, wonderful. Ryan, have a lovely day. And I hope to speak to you soon. Bye.